Still no other professors, are there? No, no other professors. Okay, here's one. So don't sit in front of our projector here. Or our camera. Our camera. We're recording it for posterity. So usually um, there's one professor that, that uh, forgets to, you know, forgets what it is. Well, you should never be me. But today you're the first one. Yeah. It's amazing. I only have one minute. Yeah. So did you read the thesis electronics? I did. Yes. It's well, man, I I never I, I did a power read. That's that's okay. <laughs> yeah. You have to quite confident everything that's in there, but well, you know, so this, this textbook, I right, all that kind of thing. <laughs> the first, the first yeah, position is paper. Yeah, paper. Especially on that. That's a pretty crazy. You haven't had a PDF Yeah, I use that. You haven't seen any other professors wanting to do that, have you, Alex? Oh, yeah, that's fine. The whole place is here, sidetracked, right? Uh, I'm like, what is this? No, it's kind of... It is strong. You should have. I mean, you know, see? But the rest of the committee is not here. Traditionally, one is missing, but not all of us at the time. Do so we have to have a quorum? <laughs> I think we have three the ones, but one person was missing. Uh, yeah, right. I've got it once by uh, by Skype. Yeah. 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 Okay, um, I'd like to welcome you to the public uh, thesis defense of John Novak. In case you don't know, my name is Gary Westfall. Um, so the way that this will go is we will have a public presentation. Um, the committee members, of course, can ask questions anytime, but I would ask the, the uh, public uh, to hold their questions to the end of this presentation, then we'll take, take uh, questions from uh, the audience. Um, and then when we're finished with that, uh, we will ask the audience, excuse the audience, and we'll have an a, um, executive session. Uh, let me just introduce the uh, learned uh, committee. Uh, so over is Michael Tennyson, Scott Pratt, Scott Bogner, and uh, Stuart Tesla. So those are the uh, committee members. Uh, really, just got a party uh, thesis. So uh, the, this thesis today will be about work done at STAR. Um, 
and we're both members of the uh, STAR collaboration at the National Lab. So uh, I'll stop talking and I'll let John start. All right, thank you, Gary. So uh, thank you all for coming. Welcome to my thesis defense. I appreciate the support. I'm going to be talking today about my research and uh, about the analysis which I've done, which makes up the bulk of my uh, PhD thesis. Um, and before we talk about the analysis, I'm going to give a little bit of uh, physics background. So um, what we've been looking at rotating here on the screen, this is uh, one of the first gold-gold collisions which was measured in the star detector. This is a, a, the geometry of the time projection chamber, and all of these tracks are, uh, are tracks from the collision. So this is just a teaser. Now, uh, into the presentation. Uh, the best place to start is uh, at the beginning. What we're looking at here is a timeline of the, the history of the universe. So time is progressing to the right. On the left, we have the Big Bang, when everything began. And on the right, we have uh, present day. Now, as we all know, just after the Big Bang, the universe was incredibly hot and dense. I mean, in these first couple seconds of the universe, nothing about any complexity existed. Now, partially that was because of the time it formed, but more importantly than that, it was just too hot. The temperature was too high. Up until about 10 microseconds after the Big Bang, it was even too hot for protons and neutrons to form. What you just had was a plasma of three quarks and gluons, what we call a quark-gluon plasma. Now, um, quark-gluon plasma has been the focus of my research. We call it a phase of QCD matter. Now, QCD, quantum chromodynamics, is the theory which explains how quarks and gluons interact. So QCD matter is just anything that's made out of quarks and gluons. Now, I said this is a phase. Well, there are other phases. So what we can do is we can make a QCD phase diagram. So this is the QCD phase diagram, but it might be uh, helpful to start off with something that we're more familiar with, a little more terrestrial. This is the phase diagram for water. So on this axis, we have temperature. On this axis, we have pressure. And then certain parts of this diagram correspond to different phases. Um, solid, liquid, gas. So we can do the same thing for QCD matter. Now for our axes, we've chosen baryon chemical potential, which you can think of as a proxy for density. It's actually a measure of how much energy it takes to add another baryon to your system, but if you just think of it as density, you won't be led too far astray, just uh, qualitatively. Now for the other axis, we're using temperature. It might seem strange to think of the temperature of these systems because they're not macroscopic, um, but the, uh, the distributions of momentum and these sorts of things are actually very thermal, so you do have a well-defined temperature. And really, temperature is just a measure of the average kinetic energy of the system. So, all right, this is our phase diagram. What phases are actually on? Well, there is one phase that we're all pretty familiar with, and that's down here. And we call this the hadron of gas phase. And this is where you're going to find protons, neutrons, pions, cans, sort of things that we're familiar with from particle physics. There's also one point in this hadron of gas phase which we're all very familiar with, and that's right over here at low temperature and about 940 MeV, very high chemical potential. And this is where the uh, bound nuclear matter exists. There's actually a liquid gas phase transition between the hadronic gas phase and the bound nuclear matter liquid phase. So that's what most people here at the lab study, this point right here. But um, this isn't the focus of my research. What I'm interested in is the part that exists up here at high temperature, quark gluon plasma. As you increase the temperature, you reach this point where your hadrons can no longer stay bound and your quarks are essentially free. Now, we all know that you can't see a lone quark off on its own due to color confinement, but within a volume of other quarks, they can absolutely be free. They're just not bound to any particular hadron. Um, and so uh, that's, uh, that's what I've been setting up here, um, quark gluon plasma. So um, how do we make quark gluon plasma? We make it using heavy ion collisions, well, relativistic heavy ion collisions. So um, this is a schematic sort of showing how the system progresses. We have our initial system where we have two nuclei, which we accelerate extremely fast. Um, and prepare to collide into each other. For my analysis, everything's been done with gold on gold. Now, gold is spherical, but you notice these things are pretty flat. And that's because they're Lorentz contracted by about a factor of 100. They're going that fast. So there's this initial state before they collide. When they collide, first there's a lot of hard interactions, quark, quark scattering, um, and, uh, and so hard interactions between the nucleons. And then these hard interactions are going to thermalize the system, and you're going to reach this QGP state that we want to study. Now, this is incredibly hot. There's very high pressure. So this is going to expand and cool very rapidly. Now, as it cools, eventually it's going to reach a point where it's too cool to still be a particle and plasma. And it's going to begin to hadronize and turn back into color neutral particles. Now, this hadronization continues until there's no more QGP left. And at this point, we say the system's reached chemical freeze-out. The chemical freeze-out of the system's chemical composition is largely determined. I say largely, not completely determined, because there's still hadronic interactions, and you can still have resonance decays and these sorts of things. But the chemistry of the system is now pretty much fixed. Your particle ratios aren't going to change a lot at this point. Now, these particles are going to, get, going to continue to interact until the system becomes so diffuse that, uh, that things just aren't seeing each other anymore, 
And at this point, you've reached kinetic freeze out. But uh, when you get the kinetic freeze out, now your thermal information about the system is pretty much fixed. After this, these particles are just going to stream out of the dark detector, and you're going to see something like what was on that very first slide of the presentation. I like to think of this as three steps. We have the hard interactions which make the quark one plasma. The quark one plasma exists until it begins to hadronize, and that continues until you get chemical freeze out. And then the system um, interacts hadronically until you get kinetic freeze out, and then that's that. <coughs> Interrupting you, you're saying this matter of factly, is this a experimentally determined chain of events, or is this is what you think should happen? No, this is experimentally determined. Um, what may be uncertain is how the QGP patternizes, whether or not you have a smooth crossover or a phase transition. Thanks. Yeah. Any questions? All right. Yes. So um, I actually have a video of this. This is, um, obviously, this isn't a real event. This is from a model. This is from URQMD, which is a, um, we call it a hadron transport model. So what we're looking at is the initial condition just before two gold nuclei at 200 GeV per nuclear ampere are about to apply. Now the white dots are neutrons and the red dots are protons. You can see that these are Lorentz contracted, like I said. Um, now since this is a hadron transport model, it doesn't actually model the quarks, so it doesn't model the plasma. The way it models the, the plasma is through colored flux tubes, which are essentially just tubes of, of quarks. And those are going to show up as yellow. And then as all the system patternizes, um, you're going to see more protons and neutrons, but there's also going to be green points, which are pions, and blue points, which are cans. So let's play this. So you can see we have a QGP forming, everything patternizes, and then we get all these particles which stream out of our detector. So what's the name of the game? Well, what we're trying to do is we're trying to explore the QCB phase diagram. We're trying to develop an understanding of what's going on here. A lot of the stuff on this image is not nearly as well constrained as, uh, as we'd like it to be, or you'd like to think would be. These squares along this chemical freeze-out line, those are experimentally determined. Um, but the, where the phase transition is, is actually very uncertain. At a uh, low baryon chemical potential, um, lattice QCD calculations suggest that we should have a smooth crossover. And it also suggests that the critical temperature is about 170 MeV, um, plus or minus a few MeV. Um, theory also tells us that we should expect a first-order phase transition for large baryon chemical potential. But where exactly the space transition exists in this, uh, this phase diagram isn't known. Well, what we can do is we can change the collision energy of our system. As we increase the energy of our collisions, it's going to increase the initial temperature of our QGP. So as you increase your energy, you're going up. Um, also, as you increase your energy, it's going to decrease the baryon chemical potential. So that's what this dotted line is. This is just sort of an estimated spot where these, uh, these collisions start out. Now, each of these collisions, we make our little ball of QGP somewhere on the phase diagram. They're going to cool along lines of constant entropy. They cool isentropically. Eventually, they cross the phase diagram, and then they make all these particles that we see in our detector. So by changing our energy, we're sampling different slices of the phase diagram. And what we're really interested in sampling is uh, slices of the phase transition. Now, there's one point in particular on the phase transition which we're very interested in, the, uh, the critical point, which is where the first order phase transition ends and the smooth crossover begins right there. So a lot of energy has been invested in searching for the location of this QCD critical point. Now you might ask yourself, why are we searching for the critical point, this point that's right out there out in the middle? And the reason is that critical phenomena, which happens at the critical point, we think should be experimentally measurable. So this should be something that should theoretically be accessible experimentally. This image here, these are from a, uh, a theorist named Misha Stepanov, and he has created a model that he calls the linear sigma model. And um, he attempts to estimate um, some of this critical behavior which happens near the critical point. Now, um, the critical behavior that we're interested in is something called the divergence of the correlation length. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. Um, in your system, you have fluctuations. And you have fluctuations all the time. But usually, these are happening on very short length scales. So the length scale of your fluctuations is called your correlation length. Now, when you get near the critical point, these fluctuations are going to happen on larger and larger length scales. Your correlation length Divergence. These colored points here, he is um, he's sort of assuming that there's a critical point somewhere in this region here between what would be sampled by 11 GeV collisions and 19 GeV collisions. This is just hypothetical just to demonstrate what this would look like. These colored shapes are the line of that shape represents a point where the correlation length is going to reach a certain magnitude. The closer you get to your critical point, the larger your correlation length is going to get. So, um, this inset up here, this omega-4, is a fluctuation observable that Stefanov has created, which is sensitive to the fifth power of the correlation length. Now, at the critical point, the correlation length theoretically would just diverge, but our system is only passing through this 
for a short period of time. It's a finite system, so the correlation line is only going to get so large. Um, on the y-axis is his uh, correlation observable, which is sensitive to the fifth order of the correlation line. And on the y-axis is the collision energy. So remember, as you change your collision energy, you're going to be scanning across the space. And so your fluctuation observable should theoretically have some wildly non monotonic behavior as you scan over where you're sampling the critical point. Now, um, we actually measured 11 GeV, and we measured 19 GeV, but we haven't measured the stuff in between. So I guess theoretically the critical point could be hiding in there, um, but we won't know until we explore it experimentally. So um, my entire talk is about fluctuations. The point is that we're trying to measure fluctuation observables, which are sensitive to the correlation length. And hope to see some non-monotonic behavior as we scan across the critical point, because that'll tell us where it is the phase diagram. But when we talk about fluctuations, it's important to keep in mind that there's actually two sources of fluctuations. There's dynamic fluctuations, which are actually coming from the physics that we're trying to study. And then there's also statistical fluctuations, which just come from the finite sampling. When I say statistical fluctuations, I don't mean we only have so many events. I mean there's only so many tracks in an event. Now, if you think of your ball of QGP as like a perfect thermodynamic system, there's some well-defined distribution under there. And if you could sample it infinitely many times, you would know exactly what its behavior is. But we can't sample it infinitely many times. We only get to sample as many times as we have tracks in our detector. So, um, so you end up, just from the central limit theorem, that there's going to be the statistical contribution to the total measured fluctuations. So this right here, I've written this out as, um, in terms of the variance of the average transverse momentum of, uh, of our events. Um, but you can do the same thing for higher moments. You can also do the same thing for other, uh, other observables, not just transverse momentum. There's been a lot of uh, energy and excitement lately talking about fluctuations of particle numbers, of the numbers of various species of particles or different charges of particles. The reason I've been studying transverse momentum is the transverse momentum is related to the temperature of the system. So that's a state variable, so we have fluctuations. We should expect to see that temperature as well, which will manifest in the transverse momentum. Now, what are some sources of fluctuations? I've already talked at length about one that's very exciting, the critical point. But theoretically, just the order of your phase transition could affect the, the fluctuations which you see. If you have a first order phase transition, you can imagine, um, you can make an argument for why there would be less fluctuations than in a smooth crossover. But there's also background sources of fluctuations which don't correspond to these bulk thermodynamic properties that we still need to think about when we're trying to infer physics from the results. You can have things like jets. During your um, initial interaction, when you're having hard interaction, a quark might be given a lot of energy and kicked out of the medium. Well, hadronize as it takes off, and we get this locally correlated um, set of particles with high momentum, and that will affect your average momentum. You can also have things like flow, where your initial ball of QGP isn't spatially symmetric. And the spatial asymmetries will manifest as momentum asymmetries, and so you'll get uh, changes in your average transverse momentum from there, too. You could also have resonance decays. You can have a particle which comes out, and it corresponds to a certain temperature, but then it decays before it's seen in the detector, so the daughter particles are going to have less momentum than, uh, than the mother particle, um, less average momentum, I should say. Um, and so that will affect things as well. So these are just things that have to be taken into account when you start trying to infer physics from the, uh, from the actual measurements. So where has all this been happening? Um, I've been doing my work out here at the lab, but at the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider. And this is located at Brookhaven National Lab in Upton, New York. This is smack dab in the middle of Long Island. In fact, this is across the street from the Physical Review Publishing Office. Now, the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider is a... Uh, is a synchrotron collider, but of course there's many steps before we get to colliding our ions. Our ions start off down here at these tandem accelerators. We have a cesium sputter source, um, which produce our ions. In our case, we're doing uh, gold. So it produces gold. They get accelerated to the tandem. So when the gold comes out of the tandems, it's going about 1 MeV per nuclear. Um, we strip it, and we send it into a booster synchrotron, which accelerates it up to about 100 MeV. They get stripped again, and they get sent into the AGS, the alternating gradient synchrotron, yet another synchrotron. And uh, they get accelerated up to about 10.5 GeV per nucleon. When they come out of the AGS, they get fully stripped, and then they get sent into RIC, or the main RIC ring. The main RIC ring actually has two independent rings which are running in opposite directions. They're completely independent, so in principle, we could run asymmetric systems like copper on gold. But all of my analysis has actually just been uh, gold on gold. So we produce ions. It takes about four hours to fill up the RIC ring. These are each going uh, 10 GeV, so that will be a center of mass collision. What? Four minutes. Four minutes. Four minutes. 
Okay, you, that's what I meant. Sorry. Yeah. You fill it in four minutes. It can be held for four hours. Um, since these are each going 10 GeV, the center of mass collision, or the, the collision energy is 20 GeV per nucleon pair. We say that's injection energy out of the AGS. But then we can ramp up all the ions in the main ring, um, in the case of gold, up to um, 200 GeV per nucleon pair. So that's 100 GeV per nucleon in each direction. Now, the injection energy is 20 GeV per nucleon pair, but we've actually managed to run at energies lower than that, 7.7 .7 GeV and 11.5 GeV. And we do that by just decreasing the energy that we're sending our ions out of the AGS and then not ramping the main ring. Theoretically, they think they can go as low as 5.5 GeV, which would be 2.5 or 2.75 out of the AGS. But, uh, but we're saving that because we haven't done that yet. So um, in 2010 and 2011, uh, here at RIC, we did what we call the RIC beam energy scan. And the point was to um, explore systematically the, the, the phase diagram, trying to study the nature of the phase transition, and specifically to look for the critical point. So we ran at these seven energies, which were chosen to be a good sampling of the available energy reach of, of RIC. So the highest energy was 200. And the lowest, 7.7, um, .7, was selected because from other experiments, it's thought that this might be near where the onset of QGP formation happens. If you have too low of an energy, you're just not going to produce important one plasma. So 7.7 um, .7 was thought to be near that. So these are the energies we ran. Now, the detector which I used was the STAR detector, um, the namesake of our collaboration. Uh, it stands for the Solenoidal Tracker at RIC. Now, STAR is an enormous detector. This is three stories tall. It's about 1,200 pounds. And most of that is actually just the magnet. There are many, many subsystems, uh, many detector subsystems in STAR. And to be honest, I didn't use most of them. There's two in particular that, um, that I use. We have a time projection chamber. Um, it's got full two pi coverage around the beam pipe and a full unit and rapidity along the beam axis. And then a time of flight detector, which is outside of the time projection chamber, um, which also has two pi coverage and a full unit eta and rapidity. Now, um, there are two other detectors on here which matter. Um, the vertex position detector, there's a mirror detector on the opposite side. And these are used in triggering uh, to record events. And they're also used in determining the position of the event inside of the star detector. And um, the beam beam counters, there's another one on the other side as well. And these are used in, in triggers. Now, I should say that this, uh, it doesn't actually look like this. Usually, this end cap is pushed up against the end here. When we talk about geometry inside a star, um, in terms of the radial uh, angle, we, uh, we say radial length of phi. And then the um, angle, sorry, the azimuthal angle. Yeah, and then the angle with respect to the, uh, the beam line, we get in terms of pseudo-rapidity theta. Now, pseudo-rapidity is just a measure of the polar angle theta. But we, uh, we prefer pseudo-rapidity because um, the multiplicity is essentially, the number of tracks produced is essentially constant in pseudo -rapidity. So before I get into the analysis, there's one last thing which I have to cover when we talk about heavy ion physics, and that's collision centrality. So um, these nuclei are very small, and it's difficult to get them to collide. And so even when they do collide, they're usually not head-on collisions. Um, in this image here, this nucleon is coming from the left, and, or this nucleus is coming from the left, and this one's coming from the right. And then this is just a view of them head-on. Well, so this is what we call a mid-peripheral collision. So um, the QGP is only going to form in this overlap region where the two nuclei actually run into each other. And so this is uh, what we call centrality. Um, if this impact parameter B was zero, you'd have a head-on collision, you'd have a very central collision, and you'd get a very large ball of QGP form. As the impact parameter gets larger, you're going to have a smaller and smaller region of, of QGP. So um, the collision centrality can affect a lot of physics observables, like the average transverse momentum, because it'll affect the amount of energy that's in the system, the volume of the system, the shape of the system. So how do we determine collision centrality? We, uh, we do it using something called multiplicity. Multiplicity is just the number of tracks that we see in our detector. In a central collision, um, you're going to get more tracks than in a peripheral collision. This image that I put up here, um, I should point out this is not data. This is just for illustrative purposes. But this is uh, supposed to be 200 GeV gold on gold with a full unit of pseudo-rapidity acceptance. On this x-axis here is our multiplicity, the number of charged particles we see in the detector. And what they're imagining is that in a very central collision where two nuclei run head-on, um, you produce something like 1,800 particles that get seen in the detector. Now, as these nuclei get more and more peripheral and there's less overlap, the number of particles that get produced goes down. So what we can actually do is we can make this spectra of the multiplicity for all our events and then say, well, I want to look at the 5% most central events. 
Well, I know that those are going to be the 5% of events with the highest observed multiplicities. So if I just chop this off here and take the top 5%, that's the 5% most central. And that's how we talk about multiplicity in terms of the centrality. Bit. So the most central events are the 0 to 5% bin. And then the next most central is the 5 to 10% bin. And then we go up in steps of 10 from there. This is just a convention. We could do finer bins or wider bins if we wanted. Now, in principle, we don't really use anything after 70, 80 percent, these very peripheral events. And that's just because that as your multiplicity gets really low, it's hard to have a trigger which triggers efficiently um, below about a multiplicity of 20. So we just don't use those. Also, if you think about it just in terms of the physics, in an ultra-peripheral collision, you're not really colliding nuclei anymore. You're just colliding a couple of protons and neutrons. And so beginning to talk about a thermalized system becomes questionable at some point. Now, there's two other ways to think about the collision centrality, and I already mentioned one, and that's the impact parameter. But you can also talk about it in terms of the number of nucleons that participate in the collision. So, in a central gold gold collision, each gold nucleus has 197 <coughs> nucleons. So, um, you get maximally nine, or 396 participating nucleons in your collision. Now, this central bin has got some width to it, and um, you know, they're not perfect spheres. So, the central bin corresponds to a number of participants on average about 300. And then as you get to peripheral collisions, you have fewer and fewer participating nucleons. So um, that's that. Any questions? Okay. So um, now into the analysis. Keep in mind that the goal here is that we want to construct fluctuation observables, which are sensitive to the correlation length of our system, and then vary our energies. That as we scan through the phase diagram, if we go over the critical point, we'll see some non-monotonic behavior. So that, that's what we're trying to do. I did two analyses. The first analysis that I did um, is actually a continuation of, of, of previously published analyses, which were done by various collaborations, including STAR. And uh, I was bringing it to the modern era with all of the data available from the beam energy scan. And that's a, this two particle tran relative transverse momentum correlation. I'm going to explain what this is on the next page. But you can think of it essentially as a dynamic measure of the variance of the average, trans um, average transverse momentum spectrum. So a purely statistical system where the average transverse momentum never changes will have a two-particle correlator of zero. The two-particle correlator is defined as such. Um, for each event, every track has got transverse momentum. So you can calculate an average transverse momentum for that event. Then you can average over many events and get an average transverse momentum averaged over events. Now, in principle, this average transverse momentum is going to depend on your collision centrality. So this average is taken as a function of multiplicity. Then for each event, for each track, you can define a relative momentum. So it's momentum relative to this average over many events. And then create this two-particle correlator. So we sum this up over all pairs of particles. So for every particle i and then every other particle. Now if, uh, if we took every particle, including itself, what you'd just be measuring is the covariance of your system. So we average this over all pairs of events and then average it over many events and we get this two-particle correlator. Now I know that kind of makes your eyes fog over. Um, but um, one way to think about this, and I demonstrate my thesis, is the two-particle correlator is the total variance of your average transverse momentum minus this term, which is just related to the variance of the PT, the, the momentum distribution, divided by the multiplicity. So this is the dynamic component of the average transverse momentum fluctuations, because it's the total minus the statistical contribution. So what does this look like? Well, first off, we need to look at what does the average transverse momentum look like. Well, um, in this plot, on the x-axis is my collision energy. So on this end is the lowest energy, 7.7 .7 GeV. And on the right is the highest energy, 200 GeV. And then on the y-axis is the average transverse momentum averaged over events. Now, there's a lot of points on here because um, I'm showing all the centrality bits. These blue points up at the top, these are the most central collisions. And these blue stars at the bottom are the most peripheral collisions, which I've studied, which is the 60 to 70 percent centrality. Now, the first thing that we see is that in central collisions, the average transverse momentum is larger than in peripheral collisions. Now, we would expect as much because when you collide your nuclei head-on, in a central collision, you're depositing more energy in the system, so the QGP is going to have a higher temperature. Temperature is related to transverse momentum, so you have a larger transverse momentum. So we expect as much. The other thing that we would expect is that as you increase your collision energy, the average transverse momentum should increase. Because as you add energy to the system, it's going to increase the temperature and it should go up. Well, what's going on down here at these three lowest points? Everything at 19.6 GeV and down. What's going on is that the chemistry of your system is actually changing. So at the highest energy, you have predominantly pines. It's almost all pines. There's a couple of protons, there's a couple of kaons, but it's mostly pines. 
Down here at 7 GeV, it's still mostly piles. But below 27, um, the pion production begins to slow down. And so your ratio of protons to pions begins to shift towards the protons. Now, if you had a thermal distribution of pions and you had a thermal distribution of protons, and they had the same temperature, the protons are actually going to have higher transverse momentum just because they're heavier. So that's what this is. This is just that we have more protons relative to pions, so this starts going up. If you look at this for individual particle species, like pions alone or protons alone, you see this monotonic increase with energy, and you also see that the protons are much higher than, than the pions. So that's what's going on there. But what about the two particle correlator? Again, the, uh, the x-axis is collision energy. The y-axis is our two particle correlator. And we have eight centrality bins here. So the blue circles is the central collisions, and the blue stars are peripheral collisions. Um, the error bars are statistical, and the error bands are systematic. But what do we see? Well, one thing we see is that as you increase in energy, this two-particle correlator increases uh, continuously. There's a pretty dramatic jump from 7 to 19, um, but it increases across the whole energy range. So that's interesting. The other thing we see is that it increases as you go to peripheral collisions. Now, there are two things that we need to think about when uh, looking at this correlator. And um, one of them is that this is an average over all pairs of tracks. In central collisions, you have less, many more tracks than you do in peripheral collisions. So if the co number of tracks goes like n, the number of pairs is going to go like n squared. So the reason that these are so low compared to peripheral collisions is because you have this dilution, because you have all these extra pairs in, this, in your average. Also, it's important to think about the fact that this is a fluctuation relative to the average. So as the average changes in magnitude, we would expect this fluctuation to change in magnitude. So first, let's scale with uh, the number of tracks. So um, again, we have energy, and now we just have our scaled correlator. And you can see that just by scaling with the multiplicity, we've largely removed the centrality dependence. I have another slide that's a little bit easier to see. How do we just switch to that? So um, this is still the y-axis. It's still our scaled correlator. But now the x-axis is centrality is given by a number of participating movements. So this is central collisions, where we have lots of participating movements. This is peripheral collisions, where there's only a few. So what do we see? Well, we still have this energy dependence. As you increase your collision energy, it goes up. But now there's very little centrality dependence, at least in the, the central and, uh, and mid-peripheral bins. There's some out here at the very peripheral bins. Well, that's interesting, because that would indicate that this fluctuation isn't related to the system size or the transverse momentum. Um, it's just largely dependent on how the collision energy. Um, so that's interesting. Well, what happens if we just scale with the average transverse momentum? Um, well, this is interesting for a couple of reasons. Uh, this is worth looking at one because this two-particle correlator is going to have some uh, dependence upon our momentum efficiencies. Well, the average transverse momentum has the same dependence upon efficiency, so by scaling like this, you actually get rid of all your efficiency effects. Um, you'll notice there's a square root here. This is just to make the units work. This has got units of momentum squared, and this has got units of momentum. So you can take a square root, or you can square this thing. I took the square root because then this makes it uh, an equivalent to other momentum fluctuation observables that other collaborations have used and published. So this image we've been looking at, on the x-axis we have energy, y-axis are scaled correlator. The blue points is the present analysis, which I did for my thesis. Uh, and then there's a bunch of other things on here. We have some green points corresponding to the experiment done by Ceres, led on a fixed target. We have a red triangle from Alice, uh, lead lead collisions measured at CERN. Um, we have some cyan stars. That's from a 2005 analysis from the star collaboration, which was actually done by my advisor here in Westfall. And, um, these yellow diamonds that you see here, what that is, is the analysis has changed a lot since 2005. We've progressed a lot, and the code has changed dramatically. So um, what I did is I got access to the original data from the 2005 paper. I reran the analysis with my analysis code to make sure that the results were still in agreement. And they are. And then we also see um, there's some open dots here which correspond to a model. This is your QMD, the Hadron Transport Model from the video back in the beginning. The error bars in this plot are all statistical, and the error bands are systematic. So what do we see? Well, we see that we agree with ourselves. That's good. Uh, if we didn't, we would have a problem. Uh, we also see that um, we're in agreement within errors with the two highest energy Ceres points. That's also good. Now, what about this lowest energy Ceres point? We uh, dramatically disagree with that. We're not particularly concerned about that, because when they were doing this, uh, this run, they had problems with their electronics, and they were missing more than half of their detector in its radial acceptance. So um, we've done some calculations to try to estimate. As a lethal. As a lethal. Sorry, I thought you were talking about 
Um, in their, yeah, their gas of meaningful acceptance. So we did some calculations to estimate what the magnitude of that effect is going to be on the fluctuation observable, and we found that it could easily increase the fluctuations by a factor of 10%. So, um, so we're not too concerned by that disagreement. Now, just taking the present analysis on its own, what it suggests is that there's this dramatic increase in collision or in fluctuations as you increase collision energy from 7 GeV up to 19.6 GeV. And, but it continues to increase all the way up to 200. Now, if you take this analysis, though, hand in hand with everything else that we, we believe is right, it seems to suggest that this increases dramatically with energy and then it may plateau and become constant. Well, that's kind of exciting. Of course, there's a lot of space out here. We really like, it would be wonderful if the Large Hadron Collider would run a beam energy scan of their own and put these, some fill in this area with some experimental points, but until they do, um, there's, just a, there's just a big question there. Now, when we compare this to the model, we see that at the lowest energy, uh, our data is consistent with this Hadron transport model. Now, keep in mind, there's no, there's no critical point in this. There's no phase transition. It's just, uh, it's just Hadronic transport. So at the low energy, we're consistent with the model, and in fact, we're consistent with zero. And then the model also increases with energy, just like our data. But there's a very large gap here between the data and the model. So there's plenty of room for interesting physics to be hiding in the data in this region. So that's that. Um, now I'll, I'll get on to my, uh, my second analysis. Um, before I, I talk about this analysis, I just want to make a point that this is a completely original analysis. Nobody's actually done this X1 before. Um, I came up with this idea, and I proposed it to Gary, and then I had to go out and construct a theoretical motivation for it. So this is pretty exciting because this is the first time this is done. So what exactly is it? Well, what we're doing is we're looking at the higher moments of the average transverse momentum distribution. So there's two ways to think about the moments. You can either thought, think of them as the central moments, and its moments. Um, so this is the definition of the nth central moment of the average of x, where x is something that's uh, got a distribution for each event. Or you can think of this in terms of cumulants. Uh, this is the definition of the nth cumulant. Now, the moments in the cumulants are essentially equivalent. They convey the same information. The first three moments and the first three cumulants are identical. Once you get above the third order, they're different, but they can be written in terms of one another. It actually turns out that the cumulants are more directly related to the physics. So here's what I mean by related to the physics. Oh, uh, yeah, and so delta x is just the, the deviation from the average of your best. So the second moment of the average transverse momentum, this is the variance in the transverse momentum, can be written out uh, as this uh, correlator of two particles summed over all pairs, even the particles with themselves, and then averaged over events. Now, this might look familiar because this is almost identical to the definition of the two-particle correlator, except in the two-particle correlator, we're not summing over all j. We're just summing over j and i equal to i. So if you sum over j equals i, you get the second moment. Well, this is exciting because if we go all the way back to Michel Stefanov's linear sigma model, he shows that the, the variance of the average PT distribution can be written as this weighted sum with a two-particle with a two-particle correlator of occupancy numbers of momentum states. You say, well, why, why does that matter? And that's because in his linear sigma model, this term here is related to the correlation length squared. Well, that's cool. So that means that if we're measuring the dynamic uh, dynamic variance of the average PT distribution, it should theoretically be sensitive to the correlation length to some power. Now, there's going to be momentum efficiencies and these sorts of things, but it could be as much as the correlation length squared. Well, what about the third moment? We can write out the third moment, and, or the third cumulant, as this three particle correlator. And then Misha, in a different paper, demonstrates that it's equivalent to this weighted average of a three particle correlator of momentum occupancy states. But this guy is sensitive to the correlation length of the sixth. So as you get to higher and higher orders, higher moments, you're sensitive to higher and higher powers of your correlation length, which is exciting because then even a small deviation in your correlation length should theoretically be measurable. Now, as you get to higher moments, you're getting two points where you're measuring further out in the tails of your distribution, so you need more statistics, and it's more sensitive to things like efficiency. So um, you'll see that once we get to the fourth cumulant, it becomes increasingly difficult to make any, any statements just due to statistics. Now, I made the point several times that we're interested in the dynamic moments, not the measured moments, because the measured moments have a statistical contribution. So I have two baselines which I've constructed to sort of estimate what the statistical contribution is. The first one is what we call the gamma baseline. So what we're looking at here is this is the average transverse momentum distribution for 39 GPV in the central bit. So the blue points are, uh, are data, and the green line is a gamma distribution. 
Now, what I did is I calculated the mean and I calculated the variance of the data, and those two parameters are enough to fully define a gamma distribution. So then I just drew it on there. So this wasn't a fit. There was no chi-squared minimization, but you can see it does an excellent job of reproducing the data. On the right here is all of the energy, starting from 7.7 .7 going down to 200, and this is for the central bit. So you can see that for all of these, the gamma distribution does a really good job of reproducing what we see. Now, you might ask, why is that? Well, if you, uh, if you have an exponentially decaying distribution, and you sample from it a finite number of times and calculate an average, um, that's just going to, that's sufficient to give you a gamma. That's the definition. You can write it out statistically and think about it. So what this is just saying is, A, we have finite sampling, and B, we have a thermal distribution which decays essentially exponentially. So, um, so that's one baseline. <coughs> the other baseline, I call the statistically sampled baseline. And what this is, is the idea is to try to construct something which has no dynamic fluctuations. This is an entirely statistical. So for each energy, each centrality bin, I've generated two spectra. One of the multiplicity of uh, the number of tracks which we saw in each event. And then one of the transverse momentum of all of those tracks. And so what we do is we sample from the multiplicity distribution, pull out some number. That's the number of tracks we have. And then you sample from the transverse momentum distribution that many times, and you calculate a new average. And so you can generate a new average transverse momentum spectrum, <coughs> which is what this is down here. These green points. This is our statistically sampled baseline, and the blue points is the data for 200 GeV central bit. Now what you see is that the means are green, which is good, because that just comes from this momentum spectrum, um, but the data is significantly wider than the sample baseline. Well, that's the point. That's because the data has got these dynamic fluctuations, which are increasing the variance. And so uh, just looking at that, it seems like our sample distribution is doing essentially what we want it to do. So what do the moments look like? Well, the first moment, this is the same thing as the average transverse momentum averaged over events. So we saw this many slides ago, so we're just going to skip to the next one. The second moment, this is the variance of the average transverse momentum. So um, the blue points are the data. The green uh, squares are the gamma baseline. Remember, by construction, the gamma baseline will have the same variance. Um, and the red triangles is our sample baseline. So the part that's really exciting is the difference between the data and the sample baseline, because that difference is the dynamic fluctuations of the average transverse momentum of second order. Now, this difference is actually exactly that two-particle correlator, which I showed in the first half of my talk, and the values match up. So we see the same thing. As you go up in energy, the, uh, the dynamic fluctuations increase, and in fact, they're negligible at 7.7 .7 GeV. Now, you might ask yourself, well, OK, well, why is this going down, though, as we go up in energy? What's that from? Well, is largely due to the statistical term, right? And the statistical term, as I showed earlier, is related to the variance of the transverse momentum spectra divided by the multiplicity. Let's see what those look like. Well, the variance of the transverse momentum spectra is largely determined by temperature and chemistry. And we see that that doesn't go up at low energy. What about the multiplicity? Oh, well, the multiplicity increases monotonically with energy. So one over the multiplicity is going to go down. So it's not this. It's just the multiplicity, which is the reason why this is so large at low energy. We're going to see that in the other moments as well. So what does the third moment look like? Again, data is blue, um, the gamma baseline is green, and the sample baseline is red. So now we see that these distributions really aren't exactly gammas. Of course, we wouldn't necessarily expect them to be perfect gamma distributions because our, our PT distributions aren't perfectly ex exponential and they're, they're truncated. Um, but, um, so the interesting thing is the difference between the data and our sample baseline, because that's, again, this measure of the third order dynamic fluctuations. We see the same thing we've been seeing everywhere else. As you go up in energy, these dynamic fluctuations increase, and they're negligible at the lower energies. In fact, the statistics here, the dynamic fluctuations are consistent with zero at uh, 11 GeV as well. Now, the other thing that's really exciting in this plot is this bump here. Remember, we're looking for some non-monotonic behavior that would indicate that we've gone to the critical point. So um, if, this was, uh, if this increase is due to something from the detector, we would expect it to show up in the transverse momentum spectra and be reproduced by the sample baseline. Now, um, it doesn't. So this could be the signal that we've been looking for, that this is the critical point. Of course, this could just be that there's something in our analysis which, which is wrong. So um, we really need to compare this with other fluctuation measures and see if other people are seeing interesting things going on here. And then we can cross-check it to see if there's something going on with the detector of the data or if there's actually some physics which is making this increase. Now, how about the, uh, the fourth cumulative? Now we're getting to this point where we just don't really have sufficient statistics to say much. So um, you can see the error bars get very, very large. We don't see anything here which is 
dramatically different, or, or we don't see anything here which contradicts the previous conclusion. The dynamic fluctuations increase with energy, and then negligible at low energy, but we really just can't make any conclusive statements because we just don't have sufficient statistics. So really, if we want to be talking about um, fluctuations of order four or higher, we need more statistics. So that's all I've got. Um, so in conclusion, we, uh, we see two things. We see that the, the dynamic fluctuations increase with energy. Um, and there's this dramatic jump from 7.7 to 19.6. And in fact, the, uh, the dynamic fluctuations are pretty much negligible at 7 GPB in errors. Um, the other thing is that we haven't observed any smoking gun, wildly non monotonic behavior, which would be indicative of a QCD critical. There's that interesting stuff going on at 39 and 62, and that's, that's exciting, but we haven't seen anything which goes there. We haven't. Um, of course, it doesn't mean that the critical point isn't there or we can't measure it. We may just not have sampled the right energy, which is why you should stay tuned, because coming in 2018, there's going to be a rich beam energy scan, too. We're going to have an improved accelerator, an improved detector, and we're going to be able to get to lower energy reefs, and maybe we can actually even see this turnaround of the QGT formation. So uh, with that, I would gladly take your questions. Okay, this is is open for questions from the board. How no. finely, um, what would you need to bend that energy, like take samples at, to direct to eliminate that energy range? Well, it, uh, it depends which theorist you talk to. I believe in um, Stefanov's linear sigma model, he says that the signal could be as small as 50 MeV in very uncountable potential. Now, what exactly that translates into in terms of energy, I can tell you. So the, the subverse between 11 and 19 is 100. Okay. So we could be hiding between 11 and 19 because that's 100 MeV. So, so you mentioned early on that things behave thoroughly. Yeah. Um, even though these are very finite systems. Is that well understood? Why? Yeah, well, I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's a thermalized system. I mean, you do have sufficient particles, particularly one that works. And, and yeah, we talk about the chemical. Yeah. Talk about the chemical ratio of particles. <laughs> oh, yeah, so we can, we can measure, we can measure the momentum distributions, and we can also measure the ratios of these particles of different species, and all of those look thermal. Um, those are explained well. In fact, Gary had a way back in the day a blast wave model that just assumed that it was essentially a fireball, and that reproduces the spectrum quite well. Okay, more questions? Uh, so, does the fact in that, was it that third cumulant that you're plotting that you deviate from a gamma distribution significantly, does that have any effect on what you can take away from that? Uh, well, not really. That so, deviation was more than the more significant than the deviation between, say, in green and red. Yeah. So um, that's sort of an open question. Uh, I mean, the gamma baseline was proposed because these things look very much like gammas. But then you can ask yourself, how much physics is it actually contained by assuming it's a gamma? Um, and the gamma distribution assumes a couple of things. It assumes that your distribution is perfectly exponential in the transverse momentum. And it also assumes that it's, it's infinite. Of course, neither of those are true. I mean, the different particle species are going to have slightly different distributions. So um, the validity of assuming it's a gamma has been questioned. So that's why the statistically sample baseline was used, because this doesn't make any assumptions about the analytic behavior of normal line distributions. It just says, let's not have any correlations and make it purely statistical. So um, it may be illuminating. It's really what is illuminating is that the data isn't a gamma, because then you know it's it's not a gamma, but the significance of that physically, I couldn't really say. So, so you're you're measuring things which give you sensitivity to this correlation plane, mm -hmm. and uh, if you're at the critical point, that's going to diverge. Yep. Um, are there subtleties with finite size effects since this is not a thermodynamic? Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, there are subtleties that it's finite size or subtleties and that it's passing through the system, uh, passing through the critical points really fast. So I mean, it can only diverge so much. And then, and the system is also rapidly expanding as it's doing this. So even if your correlation length is diverging, your system is also getting bigger. Um, so that's why I actually write this as this three particle correlator of occupancy numbers related to correlation length to the sixth. 
Um, people who have done similar fluctuation analyses for like multiplicities of various particle species um, have sat down and had theorists actually calculate what they expect their observables dependence to be on the correlation length. And it's, it's something less. Like for them, I think it's uh, sigma is like five halves or something. Um, I haven't been able to convince a theorist to, to think through what the dependence and the momentum fluctuation should be on that. But it'll be something less because of things like that. Um, so real quick, two-part question. First, since you're on this slide, uh, you kept on talking about these higher moments, uh, how you have limited statistics. Yep. Is that why you don't include a statistical error bar on this? Just oh, I apologize. The error band is statistical. Oh, OK. OK. So yes. These are not systematic errors. These are statistical errors. OK. And that was kind of like my second uh, question. Like, on a lot of these slides, you said you know these these shader regions are systematic. But you didn't, I guess, because of time, you didn't really go into too much about the sources of systematic errors. So maybe could you just comment on uh, yeah, well, so I mean, one of our biggest sources of systematic errors is, is, our, um, is our detector. Uh, we have, um, I mean, it's an enormous detector. There's lots of stuff which goes on. And so, um, yeah, I was, I was getting to that. So, um, yeah, so I mean, so there's lots of things which go into the data before I can even do this analysis. We have to, uh, we have to do good run analysis and make sure which parts of our data collection are actually good enough that we can do an analysis with. Um, we have to look at detector effects, how things vary, and we have to do corrections for that. Um, there's, there's background. There's some collisions which don't happen right at the center of the detector, and so you have to adjust those. And so the systematic errors were um, done by looking at how the, um, the analysis was performed, saying, let's say, let's vary some of these analysis cuts which we've applied to our detector configuration with this stuff. How much does that affect our results, and how certain are we that these are Yeah. Is that Yes, thank you. Excellent questions. Still time for another one or two. Can we find the committee before we uh, let the audience go? We should let the audience go and grill them in private. <laughs> Let's let the audience go. So <laughs> Yes, I do it.